So that's it. Okay, so hello everyone. Good morning. Welcome to the Tripartite Quantum Computing Seminar Series. So um, this seminar series is co-organized by Summer Fraser University, UPC, and also UVic in order to bring in the top experts in quantum computing and more generally quantum technology to share about their um, most exciting research. Uh, is intended for both the faculties, researchers, and also students. So students, do you have any questions? So please feel free to ask. This is the event for you as well. So today is our honor to have Hannes Bernian from uh, University of Chicago to tell us more about his, uh, some of the unpublished <laughs> experimental results. So um, Hannes did his PhD in QDAP with Warner Hanset. So they have worked on a couple of very important works in uh, building quantum networks with diamond spins. So in particular, in 2015, they have uh, uh, results on a loophole-free belts in the quality violation using electron spins. So that is uh, one of the most amazing results in the past decade in quantum technology, in my uh, opinion. And in fact, it has been selected as one of the physics world breakthrough in 2015. So after that, he switched gear to work with Michelle Lukin at Harvard University. So in Harvard, he worked on trap art building trap atom um, quantum processor. And in 2017, they have published uh, a result to involve um, 51 uh, atomic qubits in the trap atom uh, quantum simulator. So what is the importance of that result is that uh, at that time, Google and IBM only has less than 20 qubits and Hannes have 50. This is amazing. So in 2019, Hannes joins the uh, um, Fisker School of uh, Molecular Engineering at the University of Chicago. And later on, he received a joint appointment with the Argonne National Laboratory. So his amazing uh, 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 achievement has earned him a lot of uh, uh, awards, including IOP International Quantum Technology Young Scientist Award in 2020, and also Stolen Research Fellowship in 2021. So today he is going to tell us more about his most exciting uh, uh, quantum computing platform with threat atoms. So let's join me to welcome Hannes again. All right, uh, great. Thank you very much, uh, Kiro. That was a great introduction. So let's see if I can live up to that. <laughs> uh, so here I'm, I'm sharing my slides now and I take it you see my slides. Okay, yeah, great, thank you. Yeah, so it's really wonderful to be here. Um, I mean, virtually here, of course, I would have loved to see uh, you in person, I've never been to Vancouver. I hope we can uh, actually do that uh, sometime in the future. But this is also a really great and also a way to engage. And I hope, uh, yeah, we can actually engage. So please feel free to ask questions during the talks. After uh, the talk, um, I'd be happy to answer any question. And yeah, in my talk, what I will do today is, I would say, twofold. Uh, in the first part of my talk, I'm going to introduce to you I would say a new way or relatively new way towards building large quantum system that is based on individual trapped single atoms. And that's something I'm really passionate about. And it's something I'm doing here at the University of Chicago, where in the second part, I show you our latest progress towards making very large systems using these individual atoms. And actually what you see here in the background, um, this is maybe some of our latest results where we have here, isolated 500 atoms. So now we went from 50 to 500. So that's an order of magnitude <laughs> more from uh, what Kiro said. And actually here, each bright spot is a single atom. And there's something special. You see these two colors and I will tell you about what these two colors mean. Um, yeah, but before I uh, jump into the details and we get into the nitty gritty, I actually want to zoom out, take a little bit of a broader perspective and actually just acknowledge the fact that we are living in a really exciting time when it comes to quantum science and technology. And of course, we as researchers are incredibly excited. Even industry starts to be really excited. You see all these startups and all this money pouring in. And actually, nowadays it happens very often when you even just open the newspaper that you read something about uh, quantum science and in particular quantum computing, which somehow captures the imagination, I would say, of a wide uh, public audience. And what I would like to do now is actually a little test with you guys. Uh, and the test is to see if you have kept up with the recent quantum computing news. So, so, so here on the next slide, I will show you 
five headlines from quantum computing articles. And I have to admit, uh, one of the headlines I made up, so that's completely invented, but four of them are real news items. And, and uh, the, the game is you have to pick which one I made up. So here are the uh, five uh, articles. The first article is about history going backwards. The second one is quantum computers hacking Bitcoin. The third one describes a quantum computer that you can buy for $5,000. The fourth one is that we can detect alien civilizations through their quantum communication. And the fifth one, the quantum computer that can save us from the coronavirus. So maybe everybody has to do it for themselves a little bit, which one you would pick. I didn't set up a poll. Uh, that, that, that would also be fun, but yeah, think about uh, which one might be the fake one? And, and I'm, I'm going to resolve it. Or oh, feel free to post it in the chat also. We can do it a little bit interactive. So if you have any number that you think is not the right one, just uh, put that number in the chat. Let's see uh, what people think. So I see five could be the wrong one. Three could be the wrong one. Five, four, yeah. So, so I don't know, Kiro is very good at math. So Kiro. <laughs> um, Okay, okay, so so I see a lot of fives, fours, and okay, very good, very good. So let me resolve this and let's see uh, which one was made up. Uh, so the next slide, uh, now I'm showing uh, these different articles. So the first one was actually a New York Times article. I mean, it's always also interesting to trace back where it came from. So this was some experiment that was running on the IBM quantum machines or the little processors. And apparently if you, just evolve with the inverse so if you just do uh, u to the minus uh, one so some people think this is uh, uh, making history go backwards and that got a lot of attention here's uh, another article the desktop quantum computer uh, indeed you can buy it for five thousand dollars i mean it's maybe not the quantum computer that you're wishing for but there are these commercial products i think here it's actually spins in diamond uh, uh, that you can buy for five thousand uh, I like the alien civilizations a lot. So this is uh, recently here to uh, April, 2021. And also, I mean, this is, I think my favorite one, how quantum computers can save us from the coronavirus. And I especially like the subtitle, let's get quantum on the pandemic's ass. So, um, so actually maybe I, I didn't see so many threes uh, in the chat. So can the quantum computer hack Bitcoin? That's the one that I made up. So maybe I wasn't quite as creative as, as the news articles themselves, but I am also uh, probably there is some article in that direction. But uh, yeah, I mean, there's a lot of hype, I would say when you read the news and sometimes it goes a bit overboard and actually, I. Yeah, sometimes when you read the news, it seems like we already have these quantum computers. They are amazingly big. We have 10,000 or thousands of qubits and they can already do these wonderful things. And that's always where I think we as researchers, scientists also have to kind of educate the public that we have to be a little bit careful uh, what is actually meant here. And I would maybe comfortably say that nowadays quantum systems have maybe reached system sizes of tens of qubits. Maybe, yeah, the 53 stands out because this is this uh, wonderful result from uh, Google where they have shown this quantum advantage. I mean, basically doing a problem that is very hard, problem that's not very useful, but at least that's very hard for a classical machine. So, so I would say tens of qubits that are quite well controlled and also reasonable coherent is actually I would say still on the forefront of, of this field. And actually, I think that's already wonderful and that's really exciting. Um, what I also actually enjoy a lot in quantum science and technology is that there are so many different approaches towards, the, towards these uh, topics, towards, for example, quantum information processing. So here's an article from 2016, The Quest for Qubits from uh, Science, where they have a nice overview of all the different architectures or architectures that they considered uh, uh, promising for quantum computing. Of course, superconducting qubits, trapped ions, silicon quantum uh, dots, uh, also topological qubits that maybe have a lot of promise, but not so many metrics. And I think that didn't change so much uh, since 2016. Uh, and then also maybe spin defect centers in the solid state. 
Um, my goal today actually is to convince you, and I hope I succeed, let's check in at the end of the talk, that at least one platform is missing here. And these are neutral or arrays of trapped neutral atoms. And actually uh, just in these very simple metrics, uh, the numbers actually show that this is a really promising approach. Like with neutral atoms, you can have very long uh, coherence times. You can actually, as I will show you, trap a lot of atoms. You can do quite high fidelity logic gates. And um, yeah, I, I think it's an approach that actually very, very scalable. So let's talk about neutral atoms. And um, yeah, when I think about neutral atoms, I actually, yeah, I think of them as, I would say almost like the ideal building block to build a quantum system. So I think of them as building blocks with many desirable properties. And these desirable properties, as I already mentioned, are long coherence time. Actually, atoms, I would say, come already with decades of research. They come with a really well-developed toolbox. Think about, uh, for example, uh, atomic clocks, where we use atoms to basically define our time to define the second we use basically energy transitions in an atom we have developed over time all these tools to actually yeah manipulate these states but now we can look at it maybe in a different perspective and use these states as qubit states and then uh, what's really special about atoms is that they are indistinguishable or this is a property i enjoy very much uh, my perspective sometimes on my phd is in my PhD, I work with these NV centers and diamond, and I wanted to entangle them over large distances. But I would say half of my PhD I spent on just making one NV center extremely similar to another NV center. So one of these spins and diamond behave the same like the other spins so that you can entangle them. But with atoms, that's uh, just a given. You take one atom and you take an other atom and they will be exactly the same when it comes to their optical transitions and energies and so on. So this indistinguishability really kind of in allows you to think about how you can scale this up. And then you can really think about taking the atom as a building block and basically copy and pasting it into a larger system. I'm going to show you how you can do this copy and paste. And then with this well-developed toolbox, there are actually already kind of the tools to also get coherent interactions between the atoms um, that are very controllable and that you can then use for quantum operations uh, and um, yeah, also for quantum simulation. And then one more property I will also show you uh, is that, okay, atoms couple very efficiently to light or you can make structures where it couples very efficiently to light. And then you can also connect atoms over large distances using this light matter interface. That's something I'm also still very excited about, basically transitioning some of my uh, PhD work on long distance entanglement now to atoms. So what will, I, what will happen in this talk today? As I said in the first part, I'm going to give you a bit of a background. Uh, what is this all about? How can you trap single atoms and how can you maybe manipulate them? Think of them as qubits. How can you get coherent interactions between these atoms and use these coherent interactions, for example, to do something more uh, maybe quantum information oriented, making large entangled states, or using these interactions to do something more what people would call maybe quantum simulation, simula um, studying quantum many body physics basically on these platforms. And then in the uh, second part, or here it's the third part, I'm going to show you our progress now uh, in the lab where we basically scale these systems uh, to even larger sizes. And what's special in our uh, experiment that we have here is actually that we have two different types of atoms within the same array. So you have two different qubits and uh, this is actually a topic among many different architectures where you have maybe hybrid architectures that have several types of qubits that you can use for different functionalities and also yeah, to do, for example, a very efficient readout is something that we are really interested in. And then the last part, I'm going to talk about this light matter interface and how you can connect qubits or atomic qubits over large distances. So that's the menu for today. And as I said, I mean, really feel free to interrupt me and questions. Um, <laughs> Yeah, I just saw, uh, saw the chat, so somebody got it right. <laughs> Jeff. Thanks. Uh, so um, yeah, so let's start here at the top. Uh, number one, generating defect-free arrays. So how do we isolate single atoms? 
And actually, uh, yeah, with atoms, uh, laser light always plays a big role. So we use laser light to make a cold cloud of atom in our vacuum chamber. And then to isolate a single atom in this cold cloud, we use an optical tweezer. So this is a tightly focused laser beam uh, that you see here in the cartoon. And if it's really tightly focused, it generates basically a harmonic potential that can trap at most a single atom. And now, of course, we want to scale to a large array. So we shine many tweezers into uh, this cold cloud of atoms to trap many atoms. But actually, uh, here you see, at least in this cartoon, a problem with that. And that is uh, that the way these tweezers load is probabilistic. Sometimes they load, sometimes they don't. Sometimes they load two atoms, and two atoms actually kick each other out again. So you always end up with either zero or one atom in these optical tweezers with about 50% chance of either having zero or one. Now what's, and, and this would just uh, reside in an array with a lot of defects, but now what's really nice with recent technologies, what you can do, for example, with very sensitive cameras, you can actually take a picture and image and find out which of these traps are loaded and which ones are empty. And then you can actually get rid of the empty traps and move the ones that are loaded and create defect-free arrangements of these single atoms. And I'm going to show you uh, how that is uh, exactly done. And then once you have all the atoms in place where you want them, then you want to make them interact to make it uh, actually interesting. And there are many different ways how one could do that, how one could uh, uh, engineer interaction. One very popular method that I will talk more about uh, is the method of exciting these atoms to very highly excited so-called Rydberg states where you have very strong dipolar interactions between the atoms. And then the second way uh, is basically using light mediated interactions by, for example, coupling these atoms to photonic crystal cavities or cavities to also get interactions over uh, distances where these atoms are trapped. So let's see how this works in reality. Um, this is now uh, still a little bit old work, 2016. This was uh, during my postdoc at Harvard, uh, where we developed this uh, new technology to make these defect-free arrays. This was in one dimension. And here, actually, what you see on, is not the fluorescence of single atoms, but this is actually the trapping light. So these are these optical tweezers. You see a line of 100 optical tweezers. But then with this very sensitive camera, uh, you can actually look for atoms in these tweezers and, and you get a very clear signal uh, when you have an atom, you see a bright spot uh, and okay, when there's no atom, you don't get any fluorescence. So you can very easily now say, okay, this trap is empty and this trap is loaded. And this is exactly the information you need for this feedback where you then move these optical tweezers to create a defect-free array. So this is here between the first and the second image. There's a computer calculating, okay, which atom has to move where. All of this happens maybe on the order of 10 milliseconds, and then the atoms get moved into their uh, respective position. So here's actually a nice little movie we took, starting with a random configuration of these atoms and then moving them actually all in parallel into a defect-free uh, configuration. So this was back in 2016 in parallel to the group of Antoine Brouvet also extended these ideas to two dimensions, creating two dimensional arrays of atoms. And okay, there has been since then a lot of work. Here's a very famous uh, work. Maybe you've seen these uh, images where you can also basically yeah, trap these atoms in three dimensions and make uh, interesting uh, geometries uh, like the Eiffel Tower here in three dimensions. So this is... Uh, very nice, and I didn't even tell you which atom uh, we are using here. I mean, I always see it as the building block, the atom, but okay, uh, the atom here is rubidium, single rubidium atoms. But actually this idea of using optical tweezers to arrange these large systems is not bound to rubidium atoms and actually works very nicely for all kinds of different atoms. And there's been quite an explosion in different experiments, also going for more, I would say, yeah, maybe complicated or more interesting atoms like strontium atoms or ytterbium atoms that also can serve as really great atomic clocks, even all the way to uh, trapping uh, molecules in these optical tweezers. So it's kind of very versatile, broadly applicable technique 
to now uh, trap a single emitters like atoms and molecules in these tweezer arrays. Um, but okay, this is now uh, basically doing the copy paste. Now you have the atoms there, you can take nice pictures, maybe make even a nice image or the Eiffel Tower. But other than that, I would say it's not that interesting yet. Nothing happens. You just have these bright spots and these bright spots, um, yeah, I didn't even put a scale bar here. They're actually pretty far away. There are a few micrometers, these uh, atoms away from each other. And over a few micrometers, basically they don't interact at all with each other. They are completely unaware of their neighbors. And okay, without interactions, it's not really that interesting yet. So now in the second part, uh, I will show you how to make them interact and how to make it interesting. Uh, if you have questions on kind of this trapping and rearrangement, uh, you can ask now, or we can also talk about it later if you have any questions. Okay, then I move on to uh, the interactions. Um, so I talked about, okay, as an example, I think about uh, using rubidium atoms. That's a very popular choice of atoms because it has such a well-developed toolbox, can easily manipulate it and cool it. And rubidium atoms, when they are trapped in the optical tweezers, they are in their ground state and their wave function, the extent of the atom is maybe on the order yeah, of 0.2 nanometers. And the atoms are kind of uh, many mic or several micrometers away from each other. Now the way to get them to talk to each other is to now take this outer electron of rubidium. So you have one uh, uh, unfilled shell with one extra electron for rubidium. It's in the first group and take this electron to a very high uh, principal quantum number, take it to a very far outlying electron shell. And as you do that, for example, you take it from the principal quantum number five to principal quantum number 70, suddenly everything gets a lot bigger. So the, the atom actually physically in size basically gets blown up. I always think of these atoms or of these Rydberg atoms basically as exaggerated atoms. It's still, it's still an atom and it has all the nice features, but now everything is much larger. And also when much larger is now the interaction that you get between atoms. So, so now you think about, okay, rubidium, basically you have the positive core and you have this one extra electron. You can already think about, okay, I excited it to a very high principal quantum number state that basically increased yeah, the polarizability or think of it as like the electric dipole, uh, dipole of this atom. Now, if I had two Rydberg atoms next to each other, they will actually have extremely strong interactions. If you're an experimentalist, maybe a gigahertz means something to you. Maybe as a theorist, you should compare it to some other energy scale. For example, the lifetime of these atoms is yeah, many, many uh, uh, hundreds of microseconds long. So, so um, this gigahertz interaction is really the very dominant scale uh, over these uh, um, distances. It actually scales extremely aggressively with n to the 11th power. So if you just go a little bit higher, you get much stronger interaction. So now uh, we have our atoms sitting there. All we have to do is basically shine in now the laser light uh, that couples the atoms from the ground state, for example, uh, from this 5S state to this highly excited, uh, for example, the 70S state. And if we just have the atoms sitting there and maybe we spread them out uh, by a lot, then we can actually observe coherent oscillations between the ground state and the Rydberg state and it nicely goes back and forth. So these uh, oscillations are somewhat boring because it's just isolated atoms. In, in this experiment, we put the atoms quite far away from each other to not have any interactions and just to see how coherently can we control between the ground state and the Rydberg state. And yeah, I mean, for, for the experimentalist, um, I mean, if it oscillates and it, if it doesn't decay, that's a good sign. So basically you can do many manipulations within the coherence time of this qubit that you can now define between the ground and the Rydberg state. So this is, I would say, just some benchmarking showing you that we have coherence and that we, that we can do a coherent manipulation. Of course, what makes it interesting are the interactions. So now let's think about what happens if I bring the atoms closer to each other. We should see some effect from these interactions. Let's just think about two atoms, each atom having this ground state and this Rydberg state. 
Uh, okay, now two atoms, there should be four possible combinations. Two atoms could be in the ground state. One of them could be in the Rydberg state, the left one or the right one. And then there's also the situation where both of them are in the Rydberg state. But okay, then they have these very strong dipoles that interact with each other. So in energy, uh, this state is actually shifted by this interaction energy. So this is now the effect of the Rydberg Rydberg interaction. One of these four possibilities gets a bit of an energy shift, or I shouldn't say a bit, actually gets a very large energy shift. That is, for example, or can be much larger than, for example, the Rabi frequency. So basically the line width or yeah, the driving frequency uh, of these manipulations. And what that uh, basically means is if I now just shine in the laser light that I've shown you before, I will only excite the two atoms to this manifold with one Rydberg excitation because this manifold with two Rydberg excitations is very much detuned. And this basically is called Rydberg blockade. You don't reach the double excited state. And actually, it, if I would ask you, okay, which atom gets excited, the right one or the left atom to the Rydberg state, well, it's a completely symmetric uh, problem. So, so, so you would uh, also expect that it actually gets excited uh, to the symmetric superposition of this Rydberg excitation shared between the left and the right atom. And that's actually an entangled state. And now you can just simply by driving the atoms that you now brought maybe close to each other uh, in this blockaded regime where you get strong interactions, you can simply now apply the same laser light and create an entangled state. And that actually works really well. Here's an experiment we have done in 2018, where this entanglement fidelity, basically between Rydberg and ground state between uh, two atoms is 97%. And yeah, there has been a lot of development. Actually, people understand much better now what limits coherence in these systems. Turns out, I mean, in a lot of systems also, for example, these NV centers I work with in my PhD, you always think the, there's some decoherence in your system. When you have a system that's extremely coherent, like the atoms, actually the first thing you should think about is, uh, is your control actually that coherent? And actually for these atoms, uh, the big uh, insight was, okay, how to really make very highly coherent laser pulses that can uh, manipulate these atoms that you can really see in uh, these uh, high fidelities. And with that insight also, there has been a quite famous experiment from Manuel Andres groups from Caltech 2020, where they now have made entanglement with more than 99% fidelity. And yeah, I don't think, I mean, it gets harder and harder to uh, characterize the entanglement. But I don't think uh, we have reached any fundamental limit there yet. But this goes more, I would say, into the direction of quantum information processing, making entanglement, two qubit gates, the same platform actually is also extremely well suited to something maybe that another community would more call, I would say, a quantum simulator. Actually, for me, the two things are a little bit blurry. Sometimes I can't decide, is this now a quantum simulation or is this a computation? I think there's actually a really interesting gray zone in between where you maybe use something like a simulator to maybe solve some optimization problem. Uh, and, and then maybe you call it more like quantum information processing. Uh, Jeff has a question. I see a hand up, uh, Jeff. Yeah, no, uh, thank you. And uh, so uh, related to the last point you made, I presume that the fidelity of the entanglement when you have two atoms um, depends also on um, <clears throat> the fact that both atoms feel essentially the same uh, laser field, right? Yeah. Um, so if, if, if you want to go to beyond two atoms, mm -hmm. um, and I'm thinking more from a quantum information processing uh, perspective, um, you, you may want to address uh, two atoms at a time, mm -hmm. as opposed to eliminate the entire uh, yeah. ensemble. So, so then that strikes me as introducing some non-trivial complications because you know you would have to be able to very carefully focus mm -hmm. and localize the control beam is that right yeah no that's an excellent question and uh, yeah th this is exactly right so you 
it is adv advantageous to have the two atoms in the same laser field to get the high fidelities. On the other hand, like you say, okay, you maybe just want to isolate two atoms and not the others. And then you want to somehow shine in two laser fields. But actually, this is something we in principle already do. The way we generate these optical tweezers, and I didn't go into too much detail, that will be a little bit uh, later on, is not necessarily that we have 100 separate lasers. It's actually one laser beam that we split up into these 100 beams. And very similar technology you can also use for these Rydberg beams, where you now maybe split it up and just direct it to two atoms. But it will come from the same laser. And, and, and then you get the addressability and also the coherence. But I would say that's exactly kind of where the field now is, kind of really coming up with a very nice way of addressing these atoms in these arrays uh, that, uh, that kind of gives you individual addressability while maintaining high coherent uh, manipulation. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thank you, Jeff. Great. So, so now coming to maybe more the quantum simulation perspective, um, uh, actually, when you shine these Rydberg lasers onto uh, the atoms, uh, actually what you realize is an Ising type model. So basically you can think of these atoms maybe as spins that interact. And the Hamiltonian that describes this system uh, is, is given here. This is some form of the Ising Hamiltonian. And I, I will actually go through these terms and give you an intuitive uh, uh, understanding of these different terms. So um, uh, the first term here in, in this uh, Hamiltonian is basically just the driving, exciting these atoms from the ground state to the Rydberg state with some intensity or some Rabi frequency. This is just your laser intensity. So I'm an experimentalist. I always want to know what are the knobs. So here the first knob is just my laser intensity, how powerful the laser is. Here the second term is basically this delta is I can change the frequency of the laser. I could drive on resonance or I could drive maybe a little bit detuned. And this uh, uh, data is the detuning, so it's the laser frequency, also a knob that I control very well in the experiments. And this N operator here is just the number operator counting if I have a Rydberg atom on site I. And then this last term, this is what we talked about. This is the interaction. If I have a Rydberg atom at site I and site J, I pay an energy cost uh, Vij on that. So with that, actually, I can draw a phase diagram. And here uh, I have two axes. I have the detuning axis, and I normalize here by the uh, dry, uh, by the Rabi frequency, and I have an interaction range. And okay, let's explore this diagram a little bit. Let's first um, focus on this term. Let's forget about interactions. So let's only kind of consider here the bottom of this diagram. Basically, this detuning term here tells you it costs delta energy to put Rydberg atoms on the array. So uh, if I go to large negative detuning, then here this term is large and positive. And then the ground state that you would uh, expect is that all the atoms are just here in the ground state. So on the left side, negative detuning. Intuitively, you would expect all the atoms in the ground state. If I now crank up this detuning, so I just change the detuning of the laser beam, then suddenly to positive values, then this term becomes large negative. So I can lower my energy by having more Rydberg excitations on the array. And you would expect all the atoms to be in the Rydberg state. Okay, this, this is not super interesting yet. It gets interesting when we add the interaction. And, and now think about this interaction again in maybe from the perspective of Rydberg blockade. Let's imagine we bring the atoms now closer to each other. So they start interacting. And let's be in the regime where we now have the nearest neighbors uh, in the Rydberg blockade. So it means I cannot excite two atoms next to each other into a Rydberg state. And then indeed, uh, if we in at this interaction range, the ground state would be some thing that maybe people call a Z2 ordered state where we have Rydberg ground, Rydberg ground. And here you also see kind of the, maybe the connection to spin models. This is an antiferromagnetic state. I could also label these levels at spin up and spin down. And now you have spin up, spin down, spin up, spin down. As I bring these atoms even closer, now maybe three atoms could be blockaded and I can only have one Rydberg excitation every three atoms. So 
I don't know, that's not an antiferromagnetic state, that's now then the Z3 ordered state, this labeling is a little bit easier. And as I uh, make the interaction range even larger, I can have a Z4 ordered state. Now, the great thing is that in this platform, I'm controlling all these knobs. I'm controlling the Arabi frequency, I'm controlling the delta, so I can basically uh, reach all these points in this phase diagram. And this is what we explored a lot in this 2017 paper and since then there has been much more work on that uh, as well and what you would do in such an experiment is that you first maybe start with all the atoms in the ground state then you switch on these Rydberg coupling lasers and you sweep the detuning from negative detuning to positive detuning so you try to adiabatically for uh, deform the ground state from all the atoms maybe uh, pointing maybe spin up now into this uh, anti-ferromagnetic state. And actually, yeah, because we can measure each atom along the way, we actually see how order now builds up on these uh, arrays. So here the dark color is uh, representing atoms being in the ground state, and the bright color is atoms being in the Rydberg state. And as we go from negative detuning to positive detuning, basically see the stripe order uh, come up where you now have Rydberg, ground, Rydberg, ground. That's uh, quite nice. And now simply by bringing the atoms actually closer to each other, you are increasing the interaction range and you can also uh, explore here this Z3 ordered state. Every third atom gets excited to a Rydberg state and then here uh, every fourth atom gets excited to a Rydberg state. And okay, there's much more to be said on this. You can study how the order exactly builds up how it's dependent on how fast you go, you can study yeah, real, yeah, real in detail quantum phase transitions here. And that's what we have done then on, on the 51 atoms uh, in this case. Here you see examples with 13 atoms. Also, you can study dynamics. Maybe you don't go slow, but you go fast. Uh, and, and that's also uh, extremely interesting. And here's just um, one uh, overview of, yeah, I, I think kind of the most recent highlights, maybe from the last two years, uh, where people, for example, use these arrays as atomic clocks. People have studied topological order, topological phases in two dimensional arrays in the uh, group of uh, Antoine Brouet's, and now even topological spin liquids in uh, uh, Misha Lukin's group where I did my um, uh, postdocs. So the, uh, they now have these 2D arrays. This is really fascinating work here. And people have uh, studied dynamics. We started this in 2017, but now uh, studying that also in two dimensions is extremely interesting. And also connections to quantum many body chaos and uh, complexity has been studied here in the group of Manuel Andres. So the, uh, this is, um yeah a really open field and i think there's much more to come and <laughs> and hopefully actually there's now much more to come from our lab so now actually i want to transition a bit to uh what we are up to now so now i've given you the fundamentals and uh yeah now I'm, i want to show you uh, what we are doing and what we have planned and okay i always love giving lab tours uh, but of course it's a little bit more difficult here in the pandemic so here's my little attempt on a virtual lab tour so uh, welcome here here's my uh, lab in the eckert research center at the university of chicago we sit here in the basement and then this is uh, my lab and basically i have two main labs two large efforts one is uh, related to the or one is uh, based on atom arrays what i've just shown you and the second one is now trying to couple these arrays to light in a more quantum network setting so now let, let's first uh, here talk about the left what we are doing there um and uh, yeah, what we are doing in the lab and i've shown you already these two different colors actually we are making these uh, uh, atom arrays, but in our arrays, we have actually two atomic species or two atomic elements. We use rubidium and cesium. Uh, and now we make arrays with these two different uh, elements. And I'm going to show you why that might be interesting. But you can already guess if you have two different atoms, these atoms have very different transition frequencies. So you can basically manipulate one without having any crosstalk to the other. 
So this is kind of often maybe you've seen that in different architectures, you might think of rubidium and cesium as you have like data qubits and you have here ancillary qubits that you can use to maybe read out the data qubits or to manipulate them. So this is kind of the direction that we are thinking about. Uh, and yeah, we make large 2D arrays in our lab and actually the, the, what I've shown you in 1D translate to this. So we have a dedicated array for rubidium and one for cesium. And then uh, you would also still randomly trap these rubidium and cesium atoms. But now in 2D, you can just rearrange them row by row. So, so I could first maybe rearrange the rubidium uh, rows and then the cesium rows to make a defect free 2D arrays. So this is what we are aiming for. And uh, the way we do this, I have tried to sketch here. This actually has a little bit of the technical detail that Jeff was uh, talking about, where I said, okay, actually to make these many traps, we just use a single beam. And then we have various different devices, for example, acousto-optic deflectors that can deflect these, the single beam into many different angles to make these arrays or we have spatial light modulators, uh, SLMs. Basically, they are very similar to um, what you have in your laser projector. In the laser projector, you also have one light source and you make it into many different pixels. And with these uh, spatial light modulators, you can also make these uh, kind of patterns. And then actually, yeah, the spatial light modulators, in our case, they make a trapping pattern and the acousto-optic deflector basically picks up the atoms and puts them where we want them. This is actually very nice technology, basically, uh, especially this laser projector technology, you can make very large arrays. So this is now, I mean, you can hardly see the individual spots. So let me zoom in here. This is just a trapping array, not single atoms yet, but these would be 10,000 individual traps. Of course, for 10,000 individual traps, I have to admit the laser we have right now is not powerful enough, but we can make uh, up to a few thousand traps actually right now. And then actually uh, we have the ability to put them where we want them. So this is again, just a trapping pattern, but here, for example, we could make a honeycomb lattice, which is maybe quite interesting for quantum simulation, or we could just make uh, our Benin lab logo in, <laughs> in these traps. Um, here's a picture of the setup that we have uh, built. Uh, so, so the main part you see is a vacuum chamber. These experiments happen in vacuum. Then in this vacuum, you isolate these single atoms here using these microscope objectives. So up here, we have an atom source. We push atoms down here, and then we trap, make a cold cloud of atoms down there. And actually all our laser beams, they are basically dual wavelengths. So they both make a rubidium cold cloud and a cesium cold cloud. And then we use these microscope objectives to project our tweezer arrays in there to trap single atoms. So yeah, this is yeah, quite a nice setup uh, and there some nice technical details that I don't want to go, or go in uh, here, but I think these technical details will allow us to go to these extremely large arrays and also go to a very high principal quantum number states, much higher than before to get even larger interaction ranges. But now I wanted to show some first preliminary results. So now I'm actually coming back to the title <laughs> slide of my uh, 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 talk. So here now, maybe you can already uh, appreciate more what you're seeing. So now here you see the atom fluorescence, both from rubidium and cesium atoms. So, so now the uh, two different colors, the, the blue color are single rubidium atoms and the yellow color are single cesium atoms. And okay, um, if you see a very nice looking image, you should always ask the presenter, is this a, a, a single image or is it an averaged image? In this case, this is an averaged image. So we took maybe 50 pictures of these atoms and we added them all together. And then you see this very nice regular image. If you take a single picture, actually the quality is also really high. But here in the single picture, you see that in this experiment, at least on this large scale, we haven't done any rearrangement. So this is just random loading of the atoms in the array. Actually on a small scale, we have already done rearrangement and soon we will uh, basically do this row by row uh, protocol that I mentioned. Um, so this is 
at least to my understanding, the first uh, dual element atomic array. And, and uh, we are currently writing this up and uh, very soon you should see that with much more details. Actually, um, again, this is maybe just a nice looking image with nice colors. Can you already do maybe something with these dual uh, uh, species that you couldn't do with the single species? And um, of course, later with the interactions, you can uh, for sure do that. But actually, we found something really interesting, or I think it's interesting. It would be interesting if you find it also uh, quite uh, um, yeah, exciting. And when we were characterizing how much is actually the rubidium affected by the presence of the cesium, or how much is the cesium affected if I try to load uh, rubidium into these tweezers, we actually found that the answer is uh, not much at all, pretty negligible actually. So now you have basically two extremely independent atomic arrays. And uh, yeah, we have built something that I try to call the perpetual atom machine, basically where you can, and, and here's an experimental sequence uh, describing that we make a cold cloud of atom of rubidium to load into the tweezer, then we hold rubidium atoms in the tweezer while we make a cold cloud of cesium, load cesium atoms in the tweezer, make a cold cloud of rubidium. So basically you can alternate between rubidium and cesium and you load rubidium on top of cesium and the other way around. Actually, when you do that, because the atoms don't affect each other, you can actually always reload fresh atoms. So you can basically always have atoms in this array. So uh, this is maybe a little bit on the experimental details, but actually in these experiments, you spend a whole long time just making a cold cloud of atoms and then you load your tweezer and then you do the interesting part. Here actually now in this machine, you, you can have one array basically doing the interesting part. Let's think about like maybe some quantum computation or some quantum sensing while you actually refresh the other array and then you basically, yeah, you could imagine you could do a swap maybe between some swap operation between the two arrays to now put the quantum state into the other array while you refresh the other one. So here you basically do a back and forth between the two arrays and that enables a, yeah, what I would call a continuous mode operation that would be very hard to achieve with a single species array. So that's I think uh, something special uh, we haven't shown yet that you actually keep can keep coherence throughout this process but actually uh, here the time scales uh, this is uh, completely achievable for these uh, long-lived uh, atomic uh, hyperfine states where you can keep coherence for seconds so you could keep one coherent quantum state in one array while you refresh the other and, and while uh, through that always have an operational uh, atom array so that's quite nice um, just to maybe so this is just trying to plant some seeds. Maybe I'm looking at Kiro, maybe he comes up with a really good uh, theory proposal where we can use this. I'm trying to plant some more seeds by just showing you some um, nice images because we have this independent control. We can put atoms where we want them, these two different uh, elements. And here, for example, we could have something, maybe you could call it decorated, a hexagonal lattice where some of these plaquettes have a rubidium atom inside. They could maybe probe what is happening to the surrounding cesium atoms. Uh, we could uh, make a bipartite honeycomb lattice. Maybe this is a little bit inspired, yeah, like a, a Haldane model, basically, where you have an AB lattice in this honeycomb configuration. And if that doesn't inspire you, maybe here a picture of the Sears Tower with the bean uh, in cesium and rubidium atoms does. So this is just to show how much control we have over these individual atoms. Um, I also, of course, now I, I said, okay, if you just show uh, uh, pretty atom pictures, it's a little bit boring. And we are make, uh, working on making it interesting by now adding these coherent interactions. And actually uh, with these coherent interactions, you can now with these Rydberg uh, states, again, you can reach very interesting regimes that you wouldn't have in a single species array. So here are some um, uh, simulations. So where you can, of course, uh, excite rubidium to the Rydberg states uh, where you have these strong interactions. You can also do that with cesium. But uh, now the question is, does rubidium also interact with cesium? And here you see a small a simulation on the interaction strength 
uh, versus the distance between the atoms. And you see indeed rubidium, rubidium, cesium, cesium, and also rubidium, cesium, kind of on the same order of magnitude uh, nicely interact with each other. So this is a regime I would say, okay, why did you go through all the trouble to make now two different atoms? The interactions look very this, much the same. Actually, it's still interesting because you have independent control of rubidium and cesium. But actually you can reach also very different regimes by tuning these uh, Rydberg states that you couple it to. And you could uh, reach a regime uh, where now these interactions are actually very asymmetric by using something that's called uh, first uh, resonances, not so important, but basically at these first uh, resonances, you can increase the dipolar interactions, especially for situations between these two atomic species. So you could have a situation where rubidium cesium interacts much stronger than cesium cesium and rubidium rubidium. So this is a very asymmetric situation where you have interspecies strong interaction and inner species weak interaction. You should ask why is that interesting? Um, and I will ask Hiro that why that uh, could be interesting, but uh, maybe this small, uh, so here are some small examples where this could be interesting. For example, imagine you have one rubidium atom in the middle of many cesium atoms around it. Now, actually, if you have this asymmetric situation, this rubidium atom would interact strongly with the cesium atoms while the cesium atoms don't interact with each other. And you can use that to, uh, yeah, basically use the rubidium atom to manipulate the cesium atoms around it or actually to entangle them. So imagine you have a situation where the yellow atoms, the cesium atoms are in the ground state, the uh, rubidium atom is in the ground state. Now there are no interactions and I can just perform a pi pulse exciting these cesium atoms to the Rydberg state. But if I just change this one atom to the, uh, the rubidium atom to the Rydberg state, suddenly all of these other atoms will be blockaded. And then of course, if I would put this control atom, the rubidium atom into a superposition, and then just do this simple pi pulse on the rubidium atoms, uh, I, I will have created a, a large entangled uh, a GHC state. And, um, yeah, so this could be very efficient. This could be extendable also to long-lived hyperfine states. And I'm actually hoping that this would also be even extendable to really large arrays where maybe first I entangle rubidium atoms among each other and then use these rubidium atoms to basically fan out this entanglement to uh, also the cesium atoms. Um, in the interest of time, I'm going to skip the part where we can actually use a very similar uh, protocol to also make large cluster states. So here's a GHC state, but you can also make cluster states uh, uh, on these arrays. And I'm going to show you one more application that I'm really interesting, interested in, and that is to use now two types of atoms to have a very efficient readout. In these atomic experiments, you actually have very good readout of the qubit states, but actually these readouts, they are highly destructive. So often what you would do is basically you have two qubit states and you basically push all the atoms in one qubit state out and then you just check which atoms are left. So you just, these bright pictures, these bright dots, they are completely qubit state agnostic. So this is just showing you the presence of an atoms, but you can push out all the atoms of, of one qubit state and then just see what's left to deduce what is the qubit state. So it's a very good readout, but very destructive. Uh, now the idea here is actually to use an ancilla based readout. Basically you could do a um, C not gate uh, to, between these two different atoms to yeah, basically map the state of the data atom onto the ancilla atom and then just read out the ancilla atom. And because the wavelengths, the, these energy states, of these two atoms are so different, actually you will not affect your data qubits any more than, of course, by the projection of this quantum measurement. And with this, you should be able to do an extremely good readout. And now capturing your imagination, or that's what I'm quite excited about, you could maybe even map multiple of these data atoms onto one ancilla atom, and maybe learn something, for example, about the parity of your surrounding atoms. You, you probably can guess where this is going. So we are really interested, actually, 
in using this, for example, for implementations of stabilizer measurements and surface code, where you then actually, because you don't destroy the atoms, you don't uh, yeah, get rid of them and you don't even have crosstalk to them, can actually use your measurement results and feedback onto your data array. So that's uh, what we are quite interested in. I see I'm, I'm uh, rapidly running out of time. So I will um, basically skip, I think, the uh, atom, uh, the quantum network part, just as a motivation. Basically, here, atom arrays are really powerful. I think Adam is super excited. Now we have the two species. We can make manipulations, entangled states, cluster states, and there's a way of going to thousands of atoms. But actually, there's the second dimension. So this is the atoms qubit axis. And then there is the distance axis, basically by coupling atoms to light and, and we couple atoms to photonic crystal cavities, we can actually also transport the state of the atom or maybe uh, transport a photon that is entangled with the atom to far away atoms and connect them via entanglement. So that's something that we are also uh, very interested in and actually making very nice progress. But hopefully next time when I visit in person, then I will tell you about this. So with this, actually, I'm just uh, skipping here to my summary and outlook. I've shown you the basic, I would say, of this new platform of this arrays of individual uh, atoms for using them for quantum simulation and information processing. I've shown you our spin on that, where we uh, now have this very efficient way of making large dual species or dual element uh, atom arrays, which could be really interesting for new ways of state preparation, new ways of readout, also in the simulation maybe aspect and, and the dynamics, you could maybe think of one type of atoms like a bath for the other type of atoms. And now you have really good control over both the uh, bath and, uh, and the system. And that's something we are studying uh, with Ash Clark together. Can we maybe engineer dissipation through these channels? And then I skipped an actually really exciting part, but here I can show you one exciting picture where we are actually working now on sending single photons that are entangled with these atoms over a very long fiber between U Chicago and Argonne National Labs over 20 miles to distribute entanglement over such a distance. Okay, and with that, I thank you. And I thank my uh, wonderful group here at the University of Chicago. And okay, if you still want to stick around to ask some more questions, I'd be happy to answer all of those. Thank you. Thank you, Hannes, for the excellent talk. It's <laughs> really amazing platform. So is there any questions? I'm, I'm, I have to leave it, Jeff, here, um, but I just wanted to thank you. It was a really fantastic talk, um, doing fan, fantastic work, and I look forward to visiting in person. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, Jeff. Any other questions, comments? Uh, yep, Stefan? Yeah. Um, oh, sorry, so sorry. I, oh, yeah, uh, go ahead. I was interested in, you had sort of given some examples of other things people are doing with these lattices in terms of um, looking at things like topological order and all sorts of stuff like that. And I guess I, I was hoping you could give me a little bit of insight in um, what other kinds of control knobs you could introduce to sort mm. of customize your Hamiltonian um, mm. from like mm. an engineering perspective mm. Uh, mm. to explore all of these interesting many body system dynamics yeah. and all this kind of stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so so actually, okay, I only basically explained, oh, you have your laser intensity and maybe your detuning, uh, but actually those two knobs are already extremely powerful when you combine them also with the ability to put atoms where you want them. For example, here uh, in this, yeah, really nice work on these uh, topological spin liquids. It's still using the same knobs, basically laser detuning and intensity, but now putting these atoms on these kind of uh, triangular arrays here, where now if, if you have nearest neighbor blockade, okay, you can already guess you get a lot of frustration between them. So, so here they've used still the same knobs with this 2D positioning to uh, get frustration. Uh, and, and study these uh, spin liquids. The same knob that 
like that you can use maybe adiabatically, you can now change in time to do uh, these, yeah, what, what people call these quantum many body scars, where you study very long lived dynamics on these arrays. And uh, yeah, so, so it's also actually still the same knob, but then maybe from an engineering perspective, I think what everybody is now working towards or many are working towards is to have now these knobs for each atom individually. So what Jeff also was asking is basically addressing each atom individually and also having very good timing control. And basically then you could think of it yeah, really as a quantum processor where now maybe by steering the laser light, you perform gate operations between these qubits, these qubits and do a whole long sequence. Um, yeah, and I think uh, we, we are seeing a lot of progress towards that. So it's, uh, it's, it's the same knobs, but now for each atom individually, that, that would be the dream, I think. Cool, thank you. Yeah, thank you. I have a question. Yeah. Oh, well, Hans, first of all, thank you very much for your talk. It was very nice. Uh, I'm here at the University of Victoria, by the way. OK, great. Um, yeah, um, so my question is about uh, is, uh, the possibility of using neutral atoms for uh, universal quantum computing. Yeah. Uh, because I can see that, uh, you know, your talk and your field is moving towards, you know, the design of many body states uh, with limited control. Mm -hmm. And I want to ask you about, uh, you know, um, how many qubits you can have right now with neutral ions uh, and still have universal control and whether it's possible to scale this up to a large quantum computer? What's your perspective on that? Yeah, no, it's a, it's a great question. So I, I mean, I think, yeah, some people would probably answer this question by saying, okay, we can have a thousand qubits because I mean, I, I can make arrays with a thousand atoms and atoms are really good uh, qubits, but the question then is really, okay, how well can you control them? And then this is really where people are working. So I think it's scalability, just numbers work out great. Now it's all about uh, scaling the operations. And actually we've seen tremendous progress in that, uh, for example, I mean, I, I didn't show this slide before, but on this slide, okay, there are really good C0 gates, also Toffoli gates are there. But what is at the moment, I think still missing is like, even though we have pretty decent now multi-qubit gates too, it is now to really add all of these things together to have a long sequence of these gates. So all of these demonstrations is like one gate or maybe two gates, but I think the, the, the frontier right now is to really do sequences where you now switch the addressing, switch the operations between uh, the qubits and that has not been done yet. I, I would just say, uh, yeah. I see. So, so uh, just a quick follow up. So, my concern about this crosstalk. Yeah. So, so great. Yeah, I, I can completely understand that. And so, so the crosstalk is, for example, if I now had a grid of these atoms, and I want to say, okay, this qubit and this qubit doesn't uh, two qubit gate. Okay, I would want to focus the laser light to this one and this one without addressing the other ones. And I do think that with these Rydberg, uh, Rydberg interactions, because they are so strong, you can actually spread out the atoms maybe over five micrometer. I don't know if these numbers mean something, but five micrometer and you can maybe focus laser beams to one micrometer. So actually you can actually reach regimes where uh, there is almost negligible crosstalk between them. Okay. I think even if you don't focus the lasers down, I'm actually hoping that using two atomic species will also help with the crosstalk because now basically these have completely different wavelengths. But okay, we still have to think about the architecture, how that would look like. Okay, thank you. Can we do some dynamical decoupling to remove the crosstalks as well in this platform? Um, yes, I think that's a great question. I mean, crosstalk, what I'm most, no, I think, yeah, the answer should be yes, yes. Yes, I suppose some some global field we flip all the atoms together in in the correct way, and then maybe some cross source suppressed. Yeah, yeah, I, I think. That's, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Any other question, from the students? So I have a question. Can you can you move the atom while 
quantum information and is encoded. It's just like trap ions. You can move the ion qubits together, entangle, move them apart. Can you do that in your trap atom platform? Uh, yeah, turns out you can actually. And and uh, I think um, actually there's a yeah you can. Um, I mean, they, you have to be a bit careful that you don't uh, pick up some random faces, but people have shown coherent transport in these optical trees. Mm -hmm. So, so that's, um, do you plan to do that? Or is, is there any reason you don't do that? Because say it takes a long time or the trap is shallow that um, when you move that it lost the atom easily? Yeah, it's always kind of, it's about what you pick as your qubit state. So if you pick actually the ground state and the Rydberg state, the Rydberg state, if you don't do very special things is actually not trapped. So, so, so yeah. that one you cannot move. And then you actually just want to do your experiments very fast, kind of like down here, maybe like a microseconds, you want to very fast do your operations and then maybe put everything back in the ground state. If you do, however, use hyperfine states, uh, so, so uh, these can both be trapped and then just use the Rydberg state in between to mediate interactions. So, so that way you can do that. Uh, right now, us, we are not actively working on that. Mm -hmm. It's Thanks. a bit, I, I guess it's about time scale. It's, it's, it's yeah. the actions are very fast. I think you can do a lot of interesting stuff on that fast time scale. Okay, now you have to bridge the two time scales, uh, but that it will be very exciting too. I have another related question was, um, on the two space, um, two species uh, uh, lab test. So when you when you measure, say for example, the, the cesium atom, and you say you lost the atom because it's, it's kind of a destructive uh, measurement. Mm -hmm. So so can you say control the atom in a way that it won't collide with the rubidium at nearby, or is it an issue in your platform that uh, the collision will lose atoms or something like that? Yeah, actually, I mean, in, in these arrays, I mean atoms are really just held in place and they don't move anymore. So there are no collisions uh, anymore. There might be collisions when you have this cold cloud, but okay, now we isolate them and load them in the individual array and they are actually yeah, really far away from each other. So I guess even if you now maybe push out one type of atoms, uh, you are unlikely to crash it into the other atom. Okay, I have to rethink. That state. Yeah, but but when you when you do the measurement, mm -hmm. when we do the measurement with stand then I, I suppose the, the atom will 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 emit some fluorine slides and you're no longer trapping it anymore and the yeah. atom will move. Yeah. So so it will emit fluorescent slide, but now the nice thing could be that rubidium and cesium they have very different uh, wavelengths. Mm. So uh, one atom will not reabsorb, at least one type of atom mm -hmm. will not reabsorb. And actually as they emit photons, they can still stay trapped in, in, in their tweezers. So, so they don't mm -hmm. necessarily mm -hmm. fly away. Yeah. Okay, so after the measurement, they, they are still there. The they atoms. are still there, they can still be there, but maybe on, on your ancillary atoms, maybe your, your uh, qubit states are now have to be reinitialized. But you I could see, then reinitialize it, but you kept in your data array, you kept uh, your states uh, coherent. So that's uh, uh, the reason why you want to do say measurement based quantum computer syndrome measurement is because uh, you, you just want them to stay in there. You don't want to say move them apart to do a circuit model. And I understand it's the motivation. Um, yeah, you, yeah, I think moving them apart would be quite challenging and, and take a long time. So, so here, yeah, I, I, I don't see another way of having these kind of Q and D readouts to measure stability. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Is there any other question from the student, especially? So if not, so let's conclude here and thank us again. It's yeah. a great talk. Thank you very much. Yeah, I hope next time in person. Yeah, we will definitely invite you in the future. <laughs> thank you.